it's Laura from Doggy U, and I got a comment on one of my videos on visiting Hot Springs National Park with my service dog Cool Whip, and I wanted to address it today. If you haven't seen the video, it's a fun one, and it's a very dog-friendly national park that I want to share with you, so I'm going to link it up here and down in the comments below so that you can check it out. But here's the comment that I got. So the comment says, why do you allow your service dog to pull ahead? Double question mark. That is not, all capitalized, a well-trained dog, even if he isn't on duty. Now, I'm not sure if that last part was a statement or a question, but I'm gonna answer it like it's a genuine question asked of me. And if you've been hanging around YouTube and our channel for any length of time, I think it's pretty clear that Cool Whip is a very well-trained dog. She's quiet, unobtrusive, and well-behaved in public, and she knows a variety of tasks and skills that make it possible for me to travel alone. She makes independence and confidence possible for me, and she's been instrumental in the positive health outcomes I've had in the last year. And she's also, first and foremost, a dog. Look, folks, I will not do what this question implies I should be doing with my dog. I will not reduce my dog to a robot who isn't allowed to experience life as a dog. In fact, it's not in my best interest to turn my dog into a healing robot, and instead to have a dog who's both fulfilled for her species and individual needs, and who's encouraged to experiment and think independently to respond to situations on my behalf without fear of punishment. And I do that in two ways. One is through a clear understanding of on-duty and off-duty, so that my dog has ample time to decompress from her job and to do fulfilling behaviors for her as a dog, like running, playing, sniffing, and exploring. Number two is by using reinforcement-based training methods that encourage independent thinking through shaping and capturing. This means I train by breaking a behavior down into little pieces and mark the moment the dog makes progress towards that behavior. This allows her to exercise her critical thinking skills, something I would argue is paramount for a well-trained service dog. This is especially true for a service dog that's responding to a handler in distress or a handler that might not be able to make good decisions or think clearly during certain medical events. So these are the two topics I want to discuss today, and I don't think they're discussed enough in the service dog world. Your dog needs time to be a dog, and also, your dog should feel confident thinking independently when responding to situations on your behalf while still behaving appropriately in public. At the beginning of last year, I was going through a rough patch and I was really struggling with people in my personal space in public. A month or so prior, I had started teaching Cool Whip to watch my six or watch my back, basically to go between my legs and watch behind me when I was looking at something in front of me or when I couldn't put my back to a wall in crowded environments. Because I know my dog well, I could tell if a person was approaching by feeling the sides of her body between my legs. I happen to be a horse person, so I'm super sensitive to changes in body feel. This task reduced my startle response and thus my instances of panic in public spaces. So I was at the St. Louis Arch visiting my 33rd National Park, looking at an exhibit when suddenly Whip went from heel position, pushed herself between my legs, and looked out the back of me without me cueing it, so she got into watch position. I looked behind me and there was a person approaching in tight quarters, so she was letting me know that someone was approaching. This was a brilliant leap in thinking and not something that we had trained for, especially in a difficult environment like a museum. And here's the thing, if she believed that she had to be healing at all times and that any course of action outside of what I requested was going to cause a consequence or a punishment for her, she wouldn't have acted on my behalf. That's critical thinking. It's creativity that's allowed for within our relationship because I honor her personality and who she is inside and outside of the work that she does for me. And hey, if you like what you've seen so far, head on down and boop that like button. Cool Whip, Jake, and I would be so grateful. Now let's talk about the on-duty versus the off-duty question raised by the comment. Well, this person is upset because Cool Whip occasionally walks in front of me and sometimes has tension on the leash, though I would not categorize it as pulling per se. I want to explain on-duty and off-duty through a peek into our home life that many trainers probably won't admit to, but some of them are definitely doing. When a dog is off-duty, behavior is only a problem if it's a problem for you as an individual, as long as it's not negatively impacting those around you or their work. So I'll give you an example. My dog literally sits on the couch with me when I eat some of the time. While she has a solid place cue and I can send her there and have her stay while I eat at any time, I like sharing bits of my food with her. Sometimes I feed her sushi from chopsticks and I think it's adorable and it brings us both great joy. Is it something that I'd recommend for everyone? No, absolutely not. It could definitely cause confusion or issues for certain dogs. 
But here's the thing, this has never been a problem within Cool Whip and I's service dog work because she's the type of dog that's acutely aware of context. When we're out at a restaurant, she doesn't beg or expect food because this isn't the context that she's received food off the table. So her sitting with me at home isn't a problem. If she was begging or trying to sit at seats at a restaurant, well then I obviously wouldn't do what I'm doing with her. But she's seven and this works well for us and it's not negatively impacting her service work. Where are you going, dude? <laughs> you over it? Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> All right, so Jake's decided that it's too hot in here, which is fair. So here's an example of when I might change things for us. At some point, I'm gonna be getting another service dog prospect, a puppy. Uh, cool Whip is seven years old this summer, and it's going to take me a good two years to train up another service dog, so I have to start thinking about that. And in fact, I'm gonna be doing another video soon about succession planning for your service dog, so if that interests you, um, be sure to put that down in the comments below so that I know if that's a video you want me to make. So when that does happen and I do get that puppy, Cool Whip sitting on the couch and eating food is going to make it harder for that puppy to make good decisions. So prior to that puppy coming, I'll have her practice her known behavior of laying on a mat while I eat. This will set a good example for a young, impressionable puppy and help the puppy be successful and see a model of the behavior that I want from another member of their species. So in that case, I'd modify my off-duty behavior accordingly because it's going to help the other dog be more successful. But right now her behavior isn't a problem, so we'll keep our at-home meals the way they are and enjoy them, and then we'll keep our meals out in public appropriate and professional. The same is true of this whole healing nonsense that's implied by the question. I've taught my dog that when she's on a flat buckle collar and a short leash, we'll be engaged with each other and in a loose healing position. And when she's on a harness and a long line, she has the freedom to do dog stuff. It's her time. Sure, she needs to respond to basic cues for safety like wait, sit, come, and leave it, but she can walk ahead, stop, sniff, and do so at her own pace. She needs that. She's a high energy working breed who wasn't originally intended to be my service dog. And so I'm acutely aware of meeting her needs before she meets mine. Having her heal all the time would be an exercise in human ego and not about meeting the needs of my dog. And honestly, it would be a disservice to you as the people watching these videos. As a trainer, I feel like it's kind of my obligation to show you what the full picture of our life together looks like. What it looks like when she's working at a museum or what it looks like when we're hiking and enjoying a vacation together and what it looks like when she or I make a mistake, because we both aren't robots, and I think it's better that way. So if you're into meeting your dog's needs while also getting really lovely service dog behavior and building your relationship as a team, I want you to do two things. First, sign up for my newsletter at doggyu.com where you'll get notified of monthly events and when new videos come out. And two, if you're interested in seeing my unedited training sessions, asking questions at our monthly Q&A, and supporting the work I do here at the channel, go to patreon.com slash doggyu and join the others like you in the doggyu community who make these videos possible. And maybe leave a nice comment for us down below. I read all of them and I so appreciate the positive reinforcement. And I've left another video for you to take a look at here, so be sure to click on it. You all have an awesome day and happy training.